Okay, so let's all just settle into being here and now. <clears throat> just feeling the weight of your body on your chair. Um, maybe noticing the sensations in your feet and in your hands. And noticing the feeling of your torso expanding and contracting with each breath. So in this meditation, we're going to explore a practice that um, Rick Hansen calls the three breaths practice and use that to open into a stable, spacious, and warm-hearted presence. So, with the first kind of breath, just bring your attention to feeling the chest as a whole. Noticing the sensations in the left side of your chest. Noticing the sensations on the right side of your chest. And then noticing the sensations on the right and the left together. And then noticing the sensations in the front of your chest. And noticing the sensations in the back of your chest. And then noticing the sensations in the front and the back together. And now noticing sensations in the bottom of your chest, in the diaphragm area. And 
And then noticing sensations in the top of your chest, in the shoulder girdle, and the collarbone. And then feeling sensations in the top and the bottom together. So breathing or feeling your chest as a whole. And the second sort of breath is breathing while feeling caring. So bringing awareness to the area around your heart. Perhaps even bringing a hand to the heart. And bring to mind one or two beings that you care about. Focusing on the feeling of being caring. Not getting into complicated details of relationships or the issues, but simply staying with a feeling of warmth and caring. If it's a pet, maybe imagining holding them in your arms. Feelings of, of friendliness or kindness or even lovingness related to that particular being. So just breathing while feeling caring.
So breathing while feeling caring. If your mind wanders, just freshly recall that feeling of caring and let that loving energy draw you back in to just rest in that feeling of feeling caring. Becoming increasingly absorbed in this feeling of warmth, lovingness, goodwill, good wishes. And now the third kind of breath <clears throat> is feeling well, is breathing while feeling cared about. So just thinking of someone or some people who like you or appreciate you or who love you and just or just to include you. It could be any level of being cared about, being seen, being respected, being included, being liked, being appreciated, or being deeply loved. So just bring that being to mind and breathe while feeling cared about. Just imagining the care or the love radiating to you. Or being in the presence of someone who is deeply caring. Could be a pet, could be a spiritual figure. <clears throat>
So just see if you can help yourself feel what it's like to be loved or to be liked, to be respected, to have friendliness expressed toward you. To feel what it's like to be appreciated or respected or people to feel grateful for you, to have warmth for you, to be valued. Just see what that's like and help yourself feel that as you breathe. Just soaking in the feeling of being cared about. And for the last few minutes of the practice, just <clears throat> practice as comes most naturally to you, resting in the feeling of caring about particular beings or feeling the feeling of those beings caring for you. Or if you like, you can kind of alternate Maybe even as you breathe in and breathe out, between the feeling of love flowing into yourself and love flowing out. Just resting gently in the warmth and caring of your heart.
knowing that the sense of warmth and caring in your heart is something that is most deeply natural for you. And something that is there deep inside you that you can rely on. And that brings you or as a source of strength for you. A source of strength and also happiness. The happiness and, and joy of a warm and radiant heart. So resting in that warmth, and if you like, also letting it radiate out in all directions. Just for the last few minutes of this practice, just bring to mind any beings you would like to share the fruits of your practice with. Any beings who may be suffering or just connected with you in some way that you would like to share the, the love and the, the peace that come from your meditation with. Beings who might still be with us or beings who are, who are not with us anymore in this physical form. So just sharing your practice with them.
Okay, so uh, very good to be with you all uh, this evening. And um, I, this talk is, the topic of this talk is what is compassion? So I thought to start with a simile uh, from the early sutras that describes the attitude of compassion. So it's just like a person who is on an extended journey along a long road. Becoming sick halfway, he ex is exhausted and suffering extremely. He is alone and without a companion. The village behind is far away, and he has not yet reached the village ahead. Suppose a person comes and standing to one side, sees that this traveller on an extended journey along a long road has become sick halfway, is exhausted and suffering extremely. He is alone and without a companion. The village behind is far away and he has not yet reached the village ahead. The second person thinks, if he were to get an attendant, and emerge from being in the wilderness far away and reach a village or town and were to be given excellent medicine and be fed with nourishing and delicious food. Be well cared for. Then in this way, this person's sickness would certainly subside. So that person has extremely compassionate, sympathetic, and kind thoughts in the mind towards the sick person. Okay, and so to break down the aspects of compassion um, illustrated in this simile, um, I'll share a beautiful definition by a, a, a scholar called Tipton Jimpa. He's also a translator of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for those of you who don't know. Okay, so well, um, I would simply describe it, that is compassion, as a natural sense of concern that arises when we confront a fellow human being who is suffering or is in need. So when that happens, it's a very human natural response. There is a kind of understanding of the situation and the need. So there is a cognitive aspect to that experience and there is an emotional response. In a sense, you feel moved by the situation, so there is an emotional response to that. And then, um, from the one thing where Buddhism is quite good at, is to tease out also the more action-oriented, motivational part. Sorry, the sun is coming up here. It's in my eyes. I'll just move over. Um, so if you were more action-oriented, you would want to do something about the situation, you would want to help. And if you are less action oriented, then you would at least wish to see the situation changed. You wish to see the suffering alleviated, the need met. So that's a very simple definition. It is this natural sense of concern that arises in the face of a fellow human being's suffering. And this was um, part of a dialogue between Rick and Jimpa. And uh, Rick says, yes, I'm, I'm struck by the combination of empathy and benevolence. So empathy alone is not compassion. Someone who is trying to sell you something needs a certain amount of empathy to read you. But that doesn't mean that they care about you or are sorry about your suffering. And then I've also experienced people who are benevolent, but they're not willing to be bothered or to really feel my own suffering. So benevolence without empathy there's a kind of holiness to it for me. So it's this combination of the two together, and in that benevolence is a movement to relieve suffering. All right, so to return to the simile that we started with, uh, compassion here is a wish for others to be relieved from suffering. So there is the vision of the sick person being cared for or actually caring for that person. And this is what is described as the extremely compassionate, sympathetic and kind thoughts of a person who has come by. Um, and also as mentioned above, there are different components within compassion. So there is both the recognition of the person's suffering and the wish for them to be free from suffering. 
Uh, so to go into a bit more detail about these two components, um, as they become very important when we go down the path of developing our own compassion. So um, empathy is the ability to resonate with someone's feelings. So if someone comes up to you smiling, you smile. If someone suffers, you feel some of their suffering. And if you really empathize with someone who is suffering, um, the same area of the brain that feels pain is activated in you that is also activated in that person who is suffering. So if you're a caregiver, a nurse, a doctor, or someone who is caring for elderly parents, for example, um, if you are constantly empathizing with those you are caring for and feeling the suffering, then you can really care for your suffer yourself. Um, um, so you can burn out. And as a result, often caregivers can distance themselves from their patient, which is not good. Uh, just one moment. I'm sorry about this. Um, so there is a monk, um, Matthew Rickard, who was involved in a study where he went on in an MRI machine and practiced empathy alone for hours. And in the end, he just felt completely filled with the suffering of those he was empathized with, empathizing with. And he found this experience really exhausting. So after that, he switched to the practice of compassion. And when practicing compassion, his whole body was just filled with love. And instead of being awkward and uncomfortable and not knowing how to respond to the suffering he encountered, he like naturally moved towards it and embraced it. And also in the brain um, scanner, the areas that had lit up was like empathic distress, the pain and the fear were gone when he switched to the passion practice of compassion when he was relating to people suffering with compassion um, although he could see their suffering wholesome feelings arose so he and the researcher involved in the study came up with the idea that there's no such thing as compassion fatigue but only empathy fatigue like if you have empathy arising uh, within the vast field of loving kindness and compassion then there's a kind of buffer for that empathy and these qualities of loving kindness and compassion are qualities that can be strengthened through training. So to return to uh, Bhante and Alia's commentary on the simile, which is, is quite good, um, this also teases apart this distinction from between um, suffering and compassion from a slightly different angle. Um, so drawing a clear distinction between, and just to say all the references will be um, online later with the recording of this talk. So drawing a clear distinction between the realization that others are suffering and the wish for them to be free from suffering is important. Since mentally dwelling on the actual suffering would be a contemplation of dukkha. Such contemplation offers the basis for a meditative cultivation of compassion. The cultivation of compassion itself, however, finds its expression in the wish for the other to be free from dukkha. In this way, the mind takes the vision of freedom from affliction as its object. Such an object can generate a positive, at times even joyful state of mind, instead of resulting in sadness. So this is vital, um, and as far as meditative cultivation of compassion, can only um, lead to deeper concentration if it's undertaken with a positive or even joyful mind. So from a practical perspective also, this means that the cultivation of compassion needs to steer clear of sadness. Um, of course, this isn't easy because what, are, what causes the arising of compassion um, can naturally um, lead to being afflicted oneself by sadness. So therefore, it's um, important just to monitor closely one's response to the affliction of others. So um, this should ideally proceed from a heart that's open and genuinely receptive to the pain and suffering of others. And But the mental uh, condition 
um, has to be there of being filled with the wish for others to be free from affliction and suffering. So compassion is a kind of bittersweet emotion. On the one hand, there is genuine empathy for and a recognition of suffering. But on the other hand, there is this benevolent wish that beings be free from suffering. Um, in the later Theravada tradition, the concept of near and far enemies of the different Brahma Viharas arose. And in this case, then um, compassion, sorry, in this case, the case of compassion, if we have empathy for suffering, uh, when it leads to over-identification with the suffering of others, or we could say, you know, um, this is what is called the near enemy of compassion. And then the far enemy of compassion is obviously cruelty. So the um, explicit, here is an explicit um, statement contrasting cruelty to the meditative cultivation of compassion. Suppose someone should speak in this way. I have practiced, cultivated, and made much of the concentration of the mind by compassion. Yet cruelty still remains, having pervaded my mind. Such a one should be told, do not say this. Why is that? It is impossible. It cannot be that cruelty remains pervading the mind of one who has practiced, cultivated, and made much of the concentration of the mind by compassion. That is an impossibility. It is this release from all cruelty, namely the concentration of the mind by compassion. So this passage makes it clear that someone who has really developed compassion in themselves will no longer be overwhelmed by cruelty. And this is true not only while they are engaged in the practice, but also the genuine cultivation of compassion has deep effects on the person's character to the extent that cruelty will no longer take over their minds and motivate their actions. This will prevent them from engaging in many types of unwholesome activities. Okay, and just to finish with a few comments about the um, meditative cultivation of compassion and the place of mental cultivation and strengthening and uh, the compassionate disposition of one's mind. Um, so here is a passage from the Karajakaya Sutta. Uh, the Buddha said, Suppose there is a small boy or girl who since birth is able to dwell in the liberation of the mind through compassion. Later on, would he or she still perform unwholesome deeds by body, speech or mind? The monks answered, certainly not, blessed one. So this passage shows how the meditative cultivation of compassion transforms one's acts of body, speech and mind. Uh, the Majjhima Agama parallel to the Karajaikara, sorry, Karajakaya Sutta um, describes the actual practice which leads to compassion as a temporary liberation of the mind in the following way. A learned disciple, a learned noble disciple, leaves behind unwholesome bodily deeds and develops wholesome bodily deeds, leaves behind unwholesome verbal and mental deeds and develops wholesome and verbal and mental deeds. Being endowed with diligence and virtue in this way, having accomplished purity of bodily deeds and purity of verbal and mental deeds, being free from ill will and contention, discarding sloth and torpor, being without restlessness or conceit, removing doubt and overcoming ignorance, with right mindfulness and right comprehension, being without bewilderment, the learned noble disciple dwells, having pervaded one direction with a mind imbued with compassion. And in the same way, the second, third and fourth directions, the four intermediate directions above and below, completely and everywhere, being without mental shackles, resentment, ill will or contention, with a mind imbued with compassion that is supremely vast and great, boundless and well-developed. The learned noble disciple dwells, having pervaded the entire world. 
Then the no learned noble disciple reflects like this. Formerly, my mind was narrow and not well developed. Now my mind has become boundless and well developed. So this passage makes a few important points. First of all, as we often see in the suttas, uh, meditative cultivation is grounded in moral conduct. So in the passage above, this foundation of sila has a positive impact on the mind, enabling the practitioner to overcome the various mental hindrances that obstruct meditative cultivation. The removal of these hindrances and the establishment of sati sampajanya then lay the foundation for the meditative cultivation of compassion. Uh, this meditative cultivation takes the form of radiating the mental attitude of compassion in all directions. Such radiation is the standard mode of practice of the Brahma Viharas described in the early discourses. So the passage that we just quoted concludes by indicating that the mind, which formerly was narrow, has become boundless through meditative radiation. Such boundlessness is an intrinsic quality of the Brahma Viharas, as they are described in the early discourses. So often these states are called boundless or immeasurable, apamana. So the all-pervasive character of this radiation is illustrated through the image of a conch blower whose sound is heard in all four directions. It is just as if there were a person skilled at blowing a conch. He goes to a place where nobody has ever heard it, i.e. the sound of a conch. He climbs up a high mountain at midnight, and with all of his might he blows the conch. A wonderful sound comes out of it that pervades the four directions. And then the discourse continues by saying that in the same way, a meditator pervades all four directions with the divine abodes. Okay, so uh, that's my reflection, maybe a little bit on the short side, but hopefully there is a lot there for uh, discussion. And uh, does anyone have any uh, questions or comments or reflections yourself? <laughs> yeah, Benjamin. Hello. Um... You mentioned uh, a passage, I can't remember it particularly well because my mind's a bit foggy from being ill at the moment, but it was something along the lines of by cultivating compassion, uh, you become sort of immune to cruelty. And then further on, it became clear that it's immune to uh, exercising cruelty oneself. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on whether cultivating compassion in oneself makes one more resilient towards the cruelty of others and the cruelty you've seen in the world? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think so. You know, and I um, I just actually did a course, which I've drawn some of this material from, on, on um, compassion, cultivating compassion and in the face of conflict. Um, and um, one of the points there is that... Um, Well, it's slightly complex. I mean, first of all, we have to have our own ground, right? We have to be clear about what we value, what our plans are. We have to take care of ourselves in a sense. Yeah. If someone's being cruel to us, all these difficult actions coming towards us. But basically, we don't get free until we have compassion for that other person. And like, because we're free from the defilements at that point, right? And and there's something very um, regulating about these uh, emotions of love and compassion, like that that meditation I did with you, breathing in and out of the heart and bringing these um, warm feelings into the heart. When they do, it's actually from the Heart Math Institute, but um, uh, when they do uh, brain scans on people, <laughs> I mean, it's just loving kindness meditation, right? It's just another variation on that, obviously, but there's something about bringing the attention to the heart area that can activate those feelings. 
but the mind becomes um the heart becomes uh like nice and wavy as opposed to jagged when when the heart is out of sync so just bringing our mind to uh soak in these feelings of love and compassion which we could say are our deep home um this uh regulates our mind and our heart and our nervous system and and these things are also naturally rewarding and they are a way to uh um, increase parasympathetic tone if you want technical language and so yeah for sure and so when we are in a place of having a sense of warm-heartedness and compassion then we are in a in a resilient um, mind space and because we all know when we're reacting to things our mind uh, contracts and becomes very narrow and we do not see the big picture but when we have warmth and compassion then uh, our mind relaxes and we see the big picture and and the thing that i haven't really covered in this talk but is also very important is that compassion has to be married to wisdom right and wisdom is this like very kind of almost detached, clear seeing of what is actually happening in the situation and seeing the character of the other person very clearly. It's not like we have compassion and then become doormats. So that's just something always important to bring up in a in a situation like this. So it's, you know, it's quite complex, but for sure, coming back to that, as long as there's that clarity, that kind of you know, inner clarity, being clear about our values, being clear about what we see, then that warmth of the heart, we do it first for ourselves. Um, because it's good for us. It, it may or may not affect others, but it's good for us. So I hope that was that helpful, Benjamin. Anyway, um, has anyone else got any any questions? Yes, uh, Terry. It, it's partly on what Benjamin said. If I look at the refugee situation as it yeah. is affected in England, yeah, I can feel tremendous compassion, but I can do nothing. Right. Yeah. Or so little, it does, It makes no difference. Right. Yeah. But then when I am with my, I must say, non-Buddhist friends, I mean, most of my friends are non-Buddhist, but I, have very, I have very few friends who are Buddhist. Their take on the refugee situation, I find that it becomes them and us. Um. Mm -hmm perhaps I need to develop compassion for those friends as well with their, but I'm deeming their view as being narrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, it's but, really tricky, isn't it? Um, if people have a bit of, a of um, Yeah, well, what do we do with suffering? This is really like the first noble truth, right? Yes. There's incredible amounts of suffering and to turn towards that is not easy. Right. So most of most people, unless they've really cultivated these qualities of equanimity, of compassion, of mindfulness, then they, they really can't handle the suffering in themselves or in others. And we all know as well that there's some types of suffering we can't handle, you know, like emotions might come up in ourselves that we, you know, either it's from trauma in the past or I don't know if we haven't had our morning coffee or whatever we, we can't handle it so we just distract ourselves and sometimes it's skillful means right this is why I think these qualities of compassion and wisdom are so fundamental to the Buddhist path because they touch on the heart of of the first noble truth how we relate to it right do we see it clearly and do we have compassion and and it's actually uh, quite these are very profound qualities how are we relating to these things in our lives and yeah, like what do you do with these situations that are intractable? And as you say, you can't do much about it, but at least you cultivate compassion. So at least there's an openness of the heart and a warmth. And if you can give $5, you do, and it's something. But sometimes there are these things in the world and, and we have no power over it, right? We, we can't. We would like to, but we can't. And so at least we have compassion 
And at least if there's something small, we move towards it. But it, it's not easy to open to all of this. So, yeah, compassion for the friends and the hope that, you know, maybe over time they develop these qualities. Their life leads them to that. It is it's very tricky. And it's very tricky being, I mean, that's one lucky thing about being a monastic is that we're a lot more surrounded by fellow practitioners. I know I hear again and again friends who are practicing who, you know, aren't monastics or aren't part of a traditional community, then it's quite lonely because you're cultivating something that's quite rare in the world, actually, yes. and very much needed. So, yeah, I think it's tough. Thank you. There is a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah, that was some follows compassion. I think, well, yeah, I mean, I think it can. I, I don't think it always does. And it's such a huge topic, right? Like if we think about wisdom, it's really uh, those qualities of equanimity, of seeing clearly. Um, <clears throat> some people can be very wise or see very clearly, but maybe be a bit rational and a bit detached, right? And other people can be very compassionate, but they're not seeing clearly, so the actions don't always lead to good actions, and maybe they don't have boundaries. So the two need to come together, and they are a bit separate. But also, yeah, I agree that sometimes having a wider mind that compassion gives us means we're seeing more broadly, and so wisdom can come from that. Like, they're very interrelated, yeah, um, so we have two people um, seeing this. Shell. Thank you, Venerable. I just wanted to ask a, a practice question, um, yeah. particularly about how to cultivate compassion in times where there has been trauma and perhaps one is struggling to even meditate or even cultivate metta, Um yeah, just a really kind of foundations kind of question. Right. I mean, of course, if there is trauma or difficulties, then, I mean, I'm sure you know, you know, see someone who's a specialist in that area. I've done a little bit of work myself. And and it's true that until the nervous system has basic regulation, it, it can be tricky. I mean, so there's these simple things of feeling the hands, feeling the feet, um, also bringing like the the hand to the heart. Sometimes hand to the heart, hand to the abdomen can bring a feeling of safety. And, you know, maybe simple things like if you have a kitten, I don't know if you do a kitten or a cat or holding them. You do. There you go. There's your meditation object. I think when you hold hold that little cute one, then I think you feel a lot of love in your heart, right? And so you just hold them and, and just, just feel that love and, and develop that. And I think, yeah, they seem like a very good spiritual friend. You know, we have very deep, very deep connections with these beings. So just, you know, you start where you can, right? And then slowly it's a, it's a, there's many parts of this path. So just staying grounded, you know, hands and feet are good. Sometimes the breath is good. Sometimes it's not, right? Depending. So sometimes you can use sounds or the other thing is using space. So like if you just are aware of the space in your room now, or aware of the whole body, feeling of the whole body at once and spaciousness and then hands and feet and having some kind of go-to. So if things are coming up, well, you can feel your hands, yeah, and you can feel your feet and you can just open out into the spaciousness of, of the room or the around you. Is that is that helpful? Is that yeah, okay. All right. Um, is that Mara Mara Marbella? Yes, hello. Um so hello. My, hello. Uh so I have a question because I've had a, a more difficult conflict with somebody uh where I try to be very kind to the person. Um and kind of proud of myself for 
the kindness that I showed. But then at some point it went a bit too far because the person was kind of pushing me in ways that felt um, that I was also not feeling safe, that I was kind of feeling also like a doormat. And then um, I've now I, I took kind of a distance um, from the person. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure like when is the right moment to to show that compassion or to to go into actions again with that person or um, maybe you don't. I mean, I don't know the situation, right? And if there's someone who's intent on harming you or not respecting your boundaries, then wisdom is just seeing it for what it is. Yeah. And you can still have compassion for them in a sense um, that, okay, so one kind of extreme story I heard while doing this course is, you know, say there's someone who's kind of pretty awful, uh, really an awful offender, a child molester or something pretty intense, right? How would you have compassion for them as a kind of an edge case? Well, if you, they were 10,000 miles away and they stepped on a nail, would you want to remove that nail from the, their foot if there was no actual goodness, no moral? I mean, it's not going to affect them in any good way, their suffering. Then the human response is you would. Or that person you're having difficulty with, um, you know, they they have headache, they have toothache they're getting old, they're going to die, they're going to lose everyone who's kind to them. So you can have a sense of compassion for them as another frail human being. But also, actually, I was just doing a talk on compassion and wisdom or compassion and justice. So sometimes if some people are really giving us a hard time, then we have to see clearly and we have to put down boundaries. We have to protect ourselves. And we may at the same time have compassion for the impact that our actions have on them while taking those actions, right? So one example was, say, a judge, um, I don't know, uh, decides a criminal has to go to jail, right? And he does need to go to jail or she, you know, they've really overstepped, they're not safe in society, they really need to go. And so that would be the wisdom or justice, like really seeing clearly and at the same time, the judge could have compassion for the impact that that decision has on that person. And it's just really, I think often, I mean, something I've, because I've been delving into this the last few months, really disentangling um, just wisdom on the one side and clear seeing and compassion, like they're separate. And, you know, seeing clearly understanding maybe someone, you know, that not being kind to us, we're being very kind to them. We know we know that our behavior's been okay. We've really behaved in a way that's good, but still they're not respecting our boundaries. They're, you know, kind of being harsh or critical or overstepping. Then at a certain point we might disengage. And we may also tell other people what's happening because we need to. Not, not as a way of gossiping, right? But just in a situation that's difficult, we need allies. And and we know that this is going to impact the other person. And, and we, we we feel compassion for them about this. And still we're going to do it. Because we have to also have compassion for ourselves. And unless we've and our first responsibility is to ourselves, because we're the one we have the most power over. We can give people a lot of compassion and it may or may not have any impact. In fact, sometimes I've found myself with people who are kind of I mean, I tend a bit on the tender side, so I've never had to shore up that other side. But that actually, um, boundaries work a lot better than kindness. The kinder I am, the more behaviours will continue. But when I'm really clear and I have clear boundaries, then they will tend to... But that's uncomfortable for me. Some people, that side is very comfortable and being compassionate is a bit more uncomfortable. So we all have our, our tendencies, but that would be be my reflection and you know compassion is just one quality compassion and kindness they have to come in a cluster of mindfulness of wisdom right effort you know boundaries it all comes together and we can't just focus in on on being compassionate and being kind without the whole package otherwise we get ourselves in trouble and others in trouble and I actually read a, a quote lately you know compassion is a great thing but like anything too much can maybe be too much but of course, it's not really about having too much compassion, but it's about it being out of balance. 
and not being married and in the context of um, these other qualities. Thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. And if, if you have a chance, <laughs> just I'll put a plug into this because I got a lot of this material. Rick Hansen's Global Coalition, something or other. He's got a great course on compassion and conflict. And, uh, you know, you can apply for scholarships for it and, and all of that good stuff. So um, there's some great resources there. Melanie. Melanie, I can't quite hear you. I don't know if it's my side. Do you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I understood well, you were saying that mostly when we practice compassion, it's to... Um, it's to bring out and to develop good qualities in our ourself, our mind and our heart. And my question was, um, uh, if we if we have compassion towards somebody of a group or a group of person, do you think those person uh, can feel it also? Is there um, like sharing merits maybe at the end of the meditation or when we do a good thing do you think that those person can feel our goodwill or is it um, or is it mainly this practice of compassion for ourselves so we can be better person and then I don't know <laughs> I think it's both. Look, I think we're deeply, deeply interconnected, right? And we don't know the impact that, you know, that having having good energy and, and sharing that with others, I, I do think it makes a difference. Whether it's really direct, you know, whether people can feel it at that moment depends on their sensitivity. But I just don't think, you know, there's a lot we don't necessarily completely understand. And I think that these things actually do have a tangible benefit. I mean, I think we do these practices for a reason. Although, of course, primarily, you know, we can't fall into magical thinking and all of that. We have to be careful. But I think for sure, um, I, I think for sure they do also actually uh, impact others in a good way. I mean, there's studies about prayer and all of that kind of thing. And that, you know, when people aren't well and they get a lot of prayers, it, it is helpful. And uh, yeah, so the answer is yes to both. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, so if you're beginning to drown in empathy, so you're if you're over identifying with, um, well, um, I think. Empathy to some degree is about us. I mean, to some degree, like if we really focus on someone's pain and we're feeling pain and we're feeling stressed about it, then that's, and other people might have a response to this as well. That's kind of um, our stuff to some degree. I mean, like if we really stay focused on the other person, I guess not necessarily their pain, maybe that's part of it. Like if we really focus on someone's pain and we're empathically resonating with that, and then it becomes our pain, then that's quite a difficult place to be in. Um, so I think bringing that kindness, like bringing that um, intentionally bringing that warmth and that well-wishing and also maybe a certain amount of equanimity because like if we experience pain in ourselves, then there has to be a certain amount of equanimity and also purposely bringing in that feeling of warmth, um, like for ourselves and in that kind of situation maybe even disengaging from them for a little bit and bringing warmth to ourselves and kindness like wherever that um the pain or the suffering is in our body bring kindness to that and then but I think um one time I was uh, reading about this and 
Uh, they were talking about self-compassion in this case, but I think it's the same with other people. You don't have to touch suffering that much. And because it is painful to touch suffering. And so it's not that you're turning away from it or that you're not connecting with it, but just being in contact with it is enough. And you can, most of you can be resting in love and compassion and well-wishing while still being in touch with that. Um, and just being in touch with it a little bit will be enough to process it through. And if we think so in ourselves, like we don't have to necessarily dive into our pain and our suffering and our trauma and get carried away in it. it, it it's delicate. We also don't want to move away from it. You, you want to contact it, but largely be resting in this warmth and this compassion. And also with others, of course, I mean, it's tricky. I mean, maybe sometimes if we're getting kind of over-identified or we've picked up some emotion and it's very strong, have to take a break, walk around the block, clear the mind, right? Just let the mind kind of steady again. And But if we are with people, like if we think about people who we might be suffering very intensely, right? We might be completely breaking down or whatever, and, and they really care. We can feel their care, but they also have this like equanimity and this real warmth. Then for us, that also holds our mind and helps us to stabilize. And that they're very helpful, um, very helpful qualities for us. Whereas if we were people who get too stressed by our own stress, it, it's sometimes not helpful. Um, so just these kinds of reflections, I think these things are, you know, these are very tricky things to work with. They take time. And so both equanimity, but also bringing warmth, both if we're kind of over-identified with some sort of suffering, bringing warmth to that, our own suffering in that case. And yeah, just, just I think, emphasizing more the well wishes and, the, you know, seeing this person. They say when you practice compassion, you see them as being better right so you you see your well wishes as that may they be happy and so you're aware of um you have that rather than seeing them as sick and yeah but of course it's tricky these things are hard and when we you know this is again the heart of the path how do we how do we contact and respond to suffering but um i think also these practices are really learning how to rest and bring up this warmth in the heart uh, also for me, what I do, um, if I'm with someone and, and it's kind of intense, is I just ground, I do ground myself. So one thing is just uh, feeling feeling your hands, feeling your feet, um, being in touch with the, the sensation of the breathing, like maybe shift your attention away from the suffering a bit and get a bit of space, feel the space in the room, you know, get a bit of space. And then that warmth, but also sometimes just equanimity. I don't know. I mean, these are these are tricky things. These are very big things that we're all working with. So that's just some ideas for what they may be worth. Great question. Yeah, Joel. Hello. Uh, I was thinking about this because um, I work with this both in uh, psychiatric care and <clears throat> I'm soon to be a registered nurse. And I, if I compare myself to my colleagues and classmates I think it's the loving kindness that helps me right. yeah adding that component to it makes yeah. make the real difference because I can look at colleagues and classmates and they are <clears throat> really really distressed and I think yeah. they just miss that small thing um, that's great I think so that's been your actual I think, experience I think it's it's easy yeah. to um use professionally than familiarly, I would say. <laughs> it's easy for me <laughs> to, to add that and just uh, use my loving kindness and not get uh, distressed and just feel the happiness even though you can't can't make them well all the time. That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's, um, if anyone's interested, there's John McCransky's done a whole course on this for um, caregivers as well. He calls it resting in the field of care and kind of like what Joel was just sharing, just again and again, resting in love. Yeah, and he, he gets people just to do that, dip into that all, all the time and use that as a kind of base. So, yeah, that's really lovely. Okay. 
There is another chat available. Yeah. Is there another chat? I think I just addressed the empathy one. Uh, there's a one saying, if you're beginning to drown in empathy, how can yeah. you make? That's what I was trying to talk about just before. Sorry, I didn't read it explicitly, but yeah, they that kind of those kind of things. And uh, I need to go in a couple of minutes, actually. So if there's any final questions, that's good. But I have to leave slightly early. I double book myself. <laughs> Well, just before you head off, uh, Venerable, just want to say a huge thank you from us all here this evening and from everyone at Anna Camper for your time this morning for you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and for that really peaceful meditation as well. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's been really lovely to be with you all. So take care and on this great path. So, yeah. All right, and a more than you. Thank you for all the thank yous and well wishes, and we'll see you sometime. <laughs> okay, see you then. I'm just going to give a short talk about Dana for everyone that is able to stay and just send in some links through in the chat. So, as I said, uh, thank you so much to Venerable for joining us this evening and sharing the teachings of early Buddhism. And um, we're really grateful that Venerable has given her time. Uh, to help us with our two aims, to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening and to help establish the first full forest monastery in England where women can take full bhikkhuni ordination. We're full of metta for Venerable Chanda Terry, who is currently on Vasa retreat in Perth. Um, and so all of these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. And if you are able to give, we are asking for your dana, generosity towards Anukampa. We've seen the project flourish this year and we wish to continue to support the Bikuni Sangha in the UK and start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to house more Bikunis, more aspirants and more lay supporters. Without the, without the support of the community here this evening and the wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we're asking for monetary donations to support the expansion of Anukampa. However small or big, you're able to give every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bikuni Sangha and get even closer to having that full forest monastery for Bikunis in the UK. So please do visit the website to donate. The link is in the chat. You can offer one-off donation or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. There will be opportunities to continue offering food dana upon uh, Venerable Chanda's return, and that will be from December onwards, and also offer your time in the new year at the Vihara too. Should you wish to offer these, please drop an email to team at anukampaproject.org, and that's in the chat too. Please also see the Anukampa website for the weekly teachings being offered by the wonderful Bikunis. And I think we've still got Ajahn Pramali as well, as to doing another talk while Venerable Chanda is on retreat. Um, and on the website as well, all the links to Ajahn Brahm's teachings in November. Uh, so please do book in for those talks and day retreats. Some of them are getting quite full up already. Uh, there's also links to Venerable Chanda's teachings and retreats that she'll be giving on her return in the UK, US and Norway. Next Sunday will again be at 7.30pm British summertime. And it will be led by Aya Santachita on Times at Urgent. Let her slow down. She's a really interesting bikini, particularly on green matters as well. So thank you all so much for your time this evening. And uh, in true Anu Campus style, I think we're going to unmute everyone so we can all say goodbye to each other. <laughs>